DJ Khaled was once unanimously loved by the music industry and music fans, but for a significant chunk of his recent career, he has received a lot of hate, with many people wondering what he even does other than yelling in his songs. After being in the music industry for decades and involved in multiple controversies, Khaled has still managed to maintain important relationships with every big name in the industry. This raises a few questions, like why do all of these fans hate DJ Khaled, and how can he have friendships with huge artists like Drake with so many other people saying he doesn't do anything. They came from nothing, and then from there they got a store in the shopping center. So I would sleep at the store, I would wake up at the store, and I would just see them work seven days a week. Well, before DJ Khaled's public reputation was yelling on songs, not knowing how to produce, being a terrible musician, and being ungrateful for all of his success, DJ Khaled was, as his name implies, a DJ, and he was pretty good at his job. Khaled was the son of two Palestinian immigrants, and despite what many people believe nowadays, he actually had to struggle a lot to get to where he is. His parents moved from Palestine to New Orleans with only $20 to their name. To survive and feed the family, Khaled and his parents would sell clothes out the back of their van at local flea markets. Khaled said, They worked every day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. If I wanted to hang out with my mother and father, I had to hang out with them hustling. Eventually, his parents moved from New Orleans to Orlando, where Khaled would get his start DJing. Both of his parents were musicians, so it made sense that he decided to pursue musical interests as well. Like most parents, they weren't a huge fan of his style of music, but they would still support their son regardless of these strange loud noises coming from their garage. When thinking back to this time, DJ Khaled has said, I wouldn't say the word black sheep of the family, but I guess I was. My mother and father supported me. Other people outside the family were like, man, what's Khaled doing? He crazy. And while making music in his Orlando garage may have been the birthplace of his musical journey, it would not be for a very long time that he would actually see any success, and there would be many roadblocks along the way. Came up with that myself. The first of which came when Khaled was 16 and watched the tax issues experienced by his parents and enforced by the IRS change his life. He said, I literally watched the government take everything. His family went from living in comfort back to nothing, and it pretty much set them back to where they were when they first immigrated. Miami New Town said the family had to move back to New Orleans to regroup and Khaled followed, unable to afford Orlando on his own. He needed a job, which he briefly found at Odyssey Records. While this was an undeniable setback for the family, it led to Khaled finding the second catalyst to his inevitable success. While working at Odyssey Records, DJ Khaled met Birdman, a young Lil Wayne, and the rest of the Cash Money label. Birdman would drop off CDs and cassette tapes, Khaled remembers. I used to be the guy behind the counter. He watched Birdman and Wayne meet for the first time. Obviously, these guys would later be regular guests in his tracks, but that wouldn't be for a while. After briefly working at Odyssey, Khaled was caught making phone calls to record labels in New York while he was on the job, so he was fired. He had to make a decision, so he said, F the job, it's all about my music career. As the Miami New Times said, Khaled had already made up his mind. He was the best. After a month in jail for some traffic offenses and then a few other issues with the police, Khaled decided to move to Miami. He followed in his parents' footsteps, moving to Miami with only $20 in his pocket. He was sleeping wherever he could, taking every gig that passed him by, and was really trying to take advantage of every opportunity possible. Being in Miami, he didn't exactly stand out for being a DJ. In fact, he probably blended in due to the city's club scene. And not only was he one of many DJs trying to make it in the city, but he also didn't have the most experience. When people were looking to book him, they just saw some random kid with a lot of energy. But despite things being tough, Khaled pushed through. As Khaled was struggling to find his big break, he turned to the only radio station that would give him time. One day, Khaled knocked on the door of Cool and Dre, who at the time were running a pirate radio station with a makeshift soundboard. He said, hey, I just moved to Miami from Orlando. I've been trying to get some time on the radio and everybody keeps telling me no. I wonder if I can get some time on y'all's slot. Only a week later, Cool and Dre would take their talents to Atlanta leaving behind Khaled with full control of the station. They said, when we got back to Miami in nine months, he had already taken over the city. Not only would Khaled take over the city, but also the studio as he was forced to stay and sleep there. Khaled would wake up, DJ till sunrise, then pass out and repeat. It was this obsession with his craft that led to his early notoriety in the area. And not only did it lead to some local buzz, but also a few DJ bookings at some nightclubs. Khaled was grinding, doing everything he could to keep growing as an artist. Eventually, his persistence led to him becoming a regular DJ at a popular club in Miami. And apparently, he became so popular that there were lines out the door when he was performing. Khaled was making waves, enough to catch the attention of 99 Jams. The famous Dr. 
Luke, who was also a member of the 99 Jams team, described Khaled with this statement. It was energy. Imagine the Energizer bunny. Now imagine that bunny is big and hairy with a knack for spinning vinyl. How could you not want that on your team? Dr. Luke loved Khaled's energy so much that he let him co-host his show. The Luke Show, back in 1998. The higher ups actually hated Khaled and begged for him to be booted from the show each week. They claimed that he was too loud, unpolished, and crass. But again, Khaled's energy would save him, with Luke saying if Khaled was gone, then he himself would stop doing the show as well. So Dr. Luke really helped DJ Khaled get his start in radio and was a pivotal person in his career. DJ Khaled is another settler. He came from New Orleans. He went to Orlando, couldn't get on as a DJ in Orlando. Then he came down here to Miami, got on at Mix 96, the underground radio station. I heard him on the radio, and then I brought him to light to the mainstream on 99 Jams on my mix show. After the show's ending years later, Khaled would be rewarded for his effort by 99 Jams and was given a time slot of his own that he would maintain control of for quite some time. At this point in his career, DJ Khaled was, like his name implies, a DJ. So what happened between then and now that caused so many people to doubt whether or not he even had any musical talent? Cause we the best, you the best, <laughs> I'm the best. The cameraman right here is the best, she's the best, we the best. If you don't want to be part of the best, then you ain't the best. In 2005, DJ Khaled releasing music was even more perplexing then than it is now. Dre said that one night him, Khaled, and some others were hanging out at Khaled's house when Khaled suggested that they put together a mixtape. Someone replied, mixtape? Man, nobody wants to hear a mixtape from you. You f***ing crazy? Stick to what you do, play in the clubs, and DJ on the radio. But despite that comment from his friend, a few months later, DJ Khaled released his first mixtape ever called This Ain't A Movie Dog. It had a stacked lineup with artists like Ja Rule, Busta Rhymes, Pitbull, Jadakiss, and many more. There was also a song on this mixtape called 50 Cent, because believe it or not, at the time, they had a bit of a beef. Less than a year later, Khaled would release his first major collaboration titled We Taken Over, with big names like Akon, T.I., Rick Ross, Fat Joe, Birdman, and Lil Wayne. The song was paired with a flashy music video, which contained every luxury purchase you could imagine someone making. Basically, between me and Khaled, we pulled every favor in the book says Gil Green, the man who directed that video in just about every Khaled video since. It was also with this project that he started saying, we the best, all the time. Years later in 2010, after a few other notable drops, Khaled would release his springboard single, All I Do Is Win, which would go on to be triple platinum. This song was so popular that in 2013, President Obama would use it as his walkout song at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Around this time, Khaled also released the hit song, I'm On One, with a young Drake. DJ Khaled was clearly very self-confident and unapologetic. With records like We The Best, We Global, Victory, Kiss The Ring, and Suffering From Success, it's clear that DJ Khaled knew he was going to be big. Just like when he decided to pursue being a DJ, without many accolades, Khaled had already made up his mind he was the best. Of course he was collecting accolades like crazy, using his industry connections that he had obtained throughout the 90s and 2000s to work with some huge names on all of his projects. By this point, Khaled had released a handful of successful tracks and projects, and was rising to the mainstream. But in the mid-2010s, things were going to change for him big time. With the game-changing communication platform Snapchat taking over, came the beginning of a new type of celebrity, or at least a new title, Influencer. Khaled was actually one of the first major accounts to gain worldwide popularity on the app, garnering around 3 to 4 million views on each of his snaps. To this day on Snapchat, DJ Khaled has 13 million subscribers. On his Snapchat stories, he would go on to create a major key series in which he gave out a plethora of cryptic advice in a way that was often humorous. I'm sure most of you guys have seen his Snapchat stories, they're super funny, and if you haven't, you're missing out. Especially the arc when he was lost at sea. It's so dark out here, we don't know where the hell we at, but the key is to make it. The key is never give up. This shit real out here, boy. This shit real out With this success outside of the music realm came even more success inside the music realm. DJ Khaled already had a bit of notoriety in the music industry, but he would continue building relationships and making even better music. Khaled went on to put out four albums in a row that would reach platinum status, featuring artists like Jay-Z, Drake, J. Cole, Kendrick Lamar, Future, and on and on and on. I'm sure it's not too hard to look through these albums and find a few songs you know and possibly even love. But his surge in popularity and his energetic, goofy personality 
personality led to a lot of questions from fans. Like what does DJ Khaled do? Some people even began to hate him and his music for a variety of reasons. But artistry has never really been DJ Khaled's strong point as he's never really been an artist himself. After DJ Khaled really began blowing up in the mid 2010s, the DJ Khaled hate began bubbling. One of the first things that people, especially younger music listeners, began wondering was what does DJ Khaled even do? Many people thought that DJ Khaled was a producer, making the beats on his projects. However, they were wrong. Blackie Speaks made a video in 2017 titled, What Does DJ Khaled Actually Do?, in which he basically explained that DJ Khaled is an executive producer. Everything. Now, don't get it twisted. I have a team and I praise my team. I'm not like these other guys that hide their team. And I come to artists and I present to the artist ideas. Every record has a different story. So I come up with the artist's idea and they either love it and if they love it, they contribute to it. They make it 10 times bigger. That's why you see everybody is a producer and a DJ now. But it takes a great producer like me to tell them sounds is garbage. They're fake. Don't fall for the trap. Let's go with these sounds. Let's do this. Oh shit, this beat you presented me is dope. Give me that. Watch what I do. I make records. I make records. I find records. I put records out. Executive producers are nothing new, but because of DJ Khaled's prominence and energy, he tends to be at the forefront of these records, which tends to mislead casual music listeners. A lot of people were able to accept this and not care too much about it, but others weren't a fan of Khaled's explanation of what he does. For example, the top comment on Blackie Speaks video is, so basically he's the guy in the group project who didn't do anything and took all of the credit. For this reason, a lot of people already didn't like DJ Khaled, especially when you add the fact that he so boldly claims he He's the best and that he is a great artist. But because he had funny Snapchat stories and was at least an entertaining guy, many people let it slide. That was until he decided to ditch any humility that he had when he dissed Tyler the Creator in 2019. It all started when Tyler's Igor beat Khaled's Father of Assad for the number one spot on the Billboard 200 chart. After the results were out, Khaled used his giant reach on Snapchat to voice his complaints. In the video, he threw some shade at Tyler, pretty much calling his music weird and that he should not have gotten first. I gotta say this too. I make albums so people can play it and you actually hear it. You know, driving your car, you hear another car playing it. You know, go to the barbershop, you hear them playing it. You know, turn the radio on and you hear them playing it. You know, it's playing everywhere. It's called great music. It's called albums that you actually hear the songs. Not no mysterious shit and you never hear it. This was a bad look for DJ Khaled, a man who had always preached positivity and talked about the keys to success, hating on another man for beating him and going number one. He also complained that Billboard had discounted several of his album's sales without warning. These discounts are referring to a deal he did where he partnered with some energy drink company and every drink sold counted as an album sale, but Billboard didn't count it. And so DJ Khaled would also go on a heated rant about Billboard and his label. Not only that, but people were upset that Khaled even thought he deserved number one since he wasn't making the music. Many believe that he had no right to even suggest that. But artistry has never really been DJ Khaled's strong point as he's never really been an artist himself. He's been that guy that always sits on the side watching everybody else participate in the group project and putting his name at the fucking top saying we the best in all his songs. Cool. The thing that made that tolerable for so long was the idea that you thought maybe despite him not doing shit, he would be aware of it, you know? Like all this time, I think we'd been tolerating that DJ Khaled cosign or that DJ Khaled brand on a lot of the tracks because we're just like, hey, it's Khaled, man. You know, he's a meme. He embraced his meme. He does funny things from time to time. Like there's no reason to really hate on this dude because he he knows, right? He, he knows, doesn't he? At every single turn, it seemed like fans were enraged with Khaled and his negative reaction to getting second. Fans would go on to point out the irony of his We The Best music group and even Tyler would join in on the mocking. It was fun, it was just watching a man die inside because the under, the, under, the, the guy that, you know, the weirdo was winning. I was moonwalking in a wig. I didn't say nothing, I just let that number one speak. Nigga Ego had to deal with that because his whole identity is being number one. And when he didn't get that, that sat with him longer in real lifetime than that moment. I moved on, I went and did some shows, we went to London, cool, didn't think about it. That sat with him, because his whole identity is we the best, we the number one. When the underdog to him took that away from him, 
Tyler maintained the same energy talking about how grateful Khaled should be he even has his career. And it makes sense. Khaled seemed pathetic. Like his whole musical identity revolved around him being number one. When in reality, he isn't even making the music. Fans began to view DJ Khaled as ungrateful and undeserving of his success. It seemed as if overnight his image went from America's fun, slightly dopey uncle to a leech who is only popular off the backs of others. And with the following NFT scandal that Khaled was a part of, it looked like his image really could have been hurt. Around the same time, Khaled would dip his toes into the pool that is the crypto world. Khaled, along with the star boxer Floyd Mayweather, would be paid to endorse crypto startup Centra. What made this a problem is that Centra's promises regarding a debit card they were claiming to be making with Visa and MasterCard was not real. All the promises this organization made were fake which is crazy because they raised $32 million. It was this large fundraising that raised a flag for the SEC who would shut down the operation, and Khaled and Mayweather were fined about $152,000 as they had not disclosed to their fans that they were doing paid promo. Regardless of the fine though, Khaled decided it was a good idea to do another crypto promo, this time for NFTs, that also ended up being a scam. This was for an NFT project called Board Bunny, which was basically just a board ape copy that raised millions of dollars. And this project also ended up being another rug pull that DJ Khaled was caught promoting. I actually did a full video on these scams if you want the whole rundown, so check that out after this one if you're interested. But over the years, many people were left with a lot of questions. What happened to the grinder from New Orleans with humble beginnings and a multi-generational dream in hopes of all the late nights at the station paying off? What happened to the Khaled that gave out major keys to his young impressionable fans who thought of him as a powerful success story? Or at least that funny uncle who was saying something crazy and getting lost on his jet ski. Well, it seems like, even if it was just for a moment, he broke character. Him briefly breaking character to diss Tyler the Creator or accepting scam deals was not a good look. People thought his cockiness was a part of his character. However, after the incident with Tyler, they weren't so sure. And for many fans, that was enough to write him off. But for Khaled, he wasn't ready to quit yet. Call me asparagus. Khaled's reinvention was one that heavily relied on him going back to his roots. While his weaknesses have been exposed, his strengths were still there. He still had his infectious energy and his personality. Throughout 2023, DJ Khaled has let it shine in a plethora of mega viral videos on Instagram. Call me asparagus. <laughs> In these videos, the energy is reminiscent of his first meteoric ascension on Snapchat. He does what he does best, which is being himself as hard as he can. Realistically, he did go kind of low-key after the Tyler thing, but this comeback put him right at center stage once again with the whole world watching. Not only that, but he continued putting out music with tons of huge artists. And it seems like we may have finally gotten an insight as to why all of these giant artists are friends with him. Gil Green, Khaled's music video director for many projects, puts it in a good way. He says, I think what they don't get is that his work ethic is about bringing people together for an amazing sound. While Khaled may not have skills that seem sometimes directly impactful on the music, him and his energy are definitely a big part of why he is able to bring people together. Khaled states, I think people get with me because they know we are going to make something great. And like it or not, the music he has worked on has gone platinum more times than most artists can dream of. Miami New Times says, whatever it is you want to call his job title, it's clear no one else is doing it. And none of it happens unless he somehow makes people, very rich and powerful people, want to work with him. And while I wish this was a happy story where DJ Khaled went back to being the goofy old guy we all know and love, it's not. Despite his recent reinvention, DJ Khaled still remains a controversial figure. I actually ran a poll on my YouTube channel and a lot of people love his reinvention and his personality, but not his music. One person explained it very well, and I think it covers the general music community. After I asked if they like DJ Khaled and they said, outside of memes, no. The Tyler Beef is an example why. His music mostly sucks too. So this seems to sum up most people's opinions on DJ Khaled. Most recently though, he's been in hot water for being one of the biggest Palestinian musicians in the world with the most influence and not speaking up about the conflict in Palestine. His Instagram comments lately have been bombarded with people who just want him to say something, to make one post or at least give his thoughts on it. Yet still, he has not made a statement. So it makes you wonder if DJ Khaled is going to reinvent himself again and turn the current negative stigma around him into a positive one.